Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Monday edition of the Orange and Brown Talk podcast, a Hey Mary Kay edition of the podcast today after the Kansas City Chiefs won their second Super Bowl uh, with Patrick Mahomes at quarterback. And so we're going to start with a question about the Super Bowl. This comes from Jay in Canton. He says he doesn't know how to make this a question. Well, Jay, you made it enough of a question or at least a statement for us to lead with it. So, hey, Mary Kay, the Eagles were stacked top to bottom with talent all over the field, except maybe a corner. The Chiefs didn't have nearly as much, but had a generational quarterback and pass catcher and won. How does this make you feel about having Watson, Miles, Chubb, etc.? Also noting Mahomes did this with mostly second tier wide receivers. Well, you know, the interesting thing about this Super Bowl is that, you know, it was so close that, you know, it's almost like you can't make any sweeping generalizations about one team or the other. You know, you can't really look at the Philadelphia Eagles and say they should have done this or they should have done that. I mean, truthfully, if the holding call, which it's okay, you know, like it wasn't the worst call we've ever seen in our entire lives. But, you know, let's say, for instance, they don't call that. I've seen worse not called. So let's say they don't call that. And the um, and they let's say they go on to kick a field goal and then the Eagles come back and win it on a game-winning touchdown drive at the end. You know what I mean? Like, that one little thing in that game can change, uh, you know, who won or who lost the game. So I think they were so evenly matched, and both teams are so strong in so many ways. For me, that was the takeaway. What do these teams have? And I know you're, you're writing something about that, and I'm probably going to write something about it too, because I had been keeping notes uh, throughout the week on something sort of similar to that concept. Um, You know, like what do the Browns need to do to get there? So I think, you know, that's the, um, you know, sort of the operative thing here is the fact that, um, you know, you can see areas where the Browns need to improve if they are going to get to that level. Right. And some of those things were fairly evident to me. One of those things was they need better pass catchers. We've been saying it over and over and over again. Uh, They need better pass catchers. You need uh, an array of really amazing, good receivers and tight ends. Uh, When you looked at that game yesterday, the reason, one of the reasons why the Eagles were able to uh, really keep pace with, with the chiefs. I thought, I mean, Jalen hurts was amazing, uh, but look at AJ Brown and then look at what Dallas Got- Goddard was able to do in the second half of that game. When you look at the chiefs, you know, you didn't just have Travis Kelsey. I mean, in, in the second half, a major reason why they won that game is because Juju Smith Schuster really came up big for them. In addition to Kadarius, Tony, they had, an array of guys that you could go to. They had super creative play calling. I still don't really know exactly what you call the go into motion and then come back and don't go, you know, don't do the whole motion. I mean, how amazing was that? How amazing was that play? Did you love it? Did you see, I'm going to, I'm going to look for it here. Um, I wish I would have saved the tweet. Um, I think it was in the athletic um, about Eric B enemy and kind of how they came up with that. Um, I'm going to look I, for it here, but yeah, the way where they scored know. the two touchdowns. Yeah. Where they scored yes. the two touchdowns going opposite ways. Um, yes, I've, uh, I've got to find this somewhere. I'll, I'll look for it here while, while you're talking, but yeah, he actually kind of explained how they found it and why they did it. It was real. Oh, I actually okay. just found it. I okay. Think. Good. I, I knew there had to be a story because, you know, I mean, Andy Reid has gone back to, you know, college championship has gone back to Rose Bowl games, obviously, uh, to come up with wrinkles for a, you know, for winning Super Bowls. And so I knew there had to be a good story behind this. I love those plays. Uh, You know, everybody else, you know that Kevin Stefanski is going to use those plays at some point this year. How could you not, right? I mean, that was just a beautiful football to watch the the fake motion. I was calling them fake motions, you know? I mean, it, it, it was really cool. Well, so here it is. And this is from, um, I don't know if the author's on this page, but this is uh, Rustin Dodd. Uh, This is from The Athletic. They also utilized something they'd noticed in their film study the previous two weeks. According to Chad Henney, the Chiefs coaches had discovered 
that when the Eagles lined up in man coverage, they would overcompensate if an offense used a motion that looked like a jet sweep. On Saturday mm. night, the had put up a play on the screen for everyone on the Chiefs offense to see. It came from the Eagles game against the Jaguars earlier this season, and it featured Jacksonville receiver Jamal Agnew faking as if he were going in motion before stopping, reversing course, and getting open for a touchdown. Um, and then Henny understood the offensive mind of Jaguars coach Doug Peterson. It, it kind of goes on a little bit, but um, that that's basically what they did. They saw the Jaguars or the, the Jaguars, however you want to say it. <laughs> they saw them exploit the Chiefs with something similar. And, you know, during the regular season, so they went all the way back and found that. And they used it twice going opposite directions to, to score big touchdowns. Yeah, it, it was fantastic. I was like, that is just Andy Reid. And they do it on back-to-back touchdowns. It's, it's like, are you kidding me? You know, I mean, who would think, first of all, that you're going to see that one time in a game, but not once, but twice in the same game? I mean, that was just poetry in motion right there. Uh, so you need to you need to have that. You need to have some wrinkles. You need in-game uh, adjustments. You need to do some things that are going to shock and surprise, right? I mean, you have to do that. You have to be off the charts brilliant in in your play calling. Uh, There there are reasons why these teams are in the Super Bowl. I, I noticed throughout the week, Dan, that there was just an excellence from top to bottom. Just from top to bottom, things are done Correctly. I, I always say this, like when you go, when I go to a restaurant, uh, you know, and, and I'm fine dining, I like everything to be just so from start to finish. You don't want to go to try to put butter on the bread and it's too hard to spread, right? I mean, the bread needs to be amazing. The butter needs to be at the right temperature. Uh, you know, it just, it has to be from beginning to end good. And I think that's what I saw with the Eagles and the Kansas City Chiefs throughout the whole week and throughout that game is they were good from top to bottom uh, almost in every single way. Now, teams, when you put together, you know, 90 people, you're going to have, you know, not everything is going to be perfect all the time. Uh, there's just no way you're going to do that. But um, but for the most part, there is a culture, a culture that sort of permeates the whole entire operation. And, and I thought that was huge. And I think when you talk about the receivers, the way that both teams built, they, they were built really differently, right? That the Eagles have, and some of it is because the Eagles have a guy who, at least for now, not for much longer is on a rookie contract. Um, not just a rookie contract, but a second round rookie contract. Um, you know, they used the number 10 pick on Devonte Smith and they went out and they paid a bunch of money and made a huge trade to get AJ Brown. While the Chiefs went out and pulled Juju off the scrap heap, drafted Sky Moore, who did, who scored his first touchdown literally last night. That was his first career touchdown. <laughs> um, the Giants didn't want Kadarius Toney. They picked him number one overall and changed front office and coaches and didn't want him. So they gave up a third and a sixth. I mean, we're talking about guys they rescued off the scrap heap that fit what they want. And they just kind of figured out how to use them and they stuck with them and they fit them into their system. And for the Browns, I just don't know that we've seen enough of that. Like, like when you think about David Bell's rookie season, it like he should have, they should have figured out a better way to, to utilize a guy like that. I would then, you know, maybe, or, you know, maybe he's just not that guy. I don't know. It's one of those two things, but I, I think it's little things like that that are a little disappointing when you kind of look back on, on some guys this year. Yeah, and I talked to David Bell not too long ago, and he really has the bar set high for himself. He was disappointed in his rookie year. He only had 24 receptions on 35 targets, and he, you know, he wasn't overly thrilled with how how things went. But you know, that's just another, um, you know, the, like the point that we're making is that you have to be deep all the way back. I mean, you you know, the, the common denominator between amongst some of those people that you're talking about is they're huge playmakers. Like they are going to go out there and make plays. Juju Smith-Schuster is a major reason why they won that game. He really is. I mean, there was that drive that was where he had like three catches on the, on, on one drive. I mean, he came alive with like five receptions in the second half of the game. And that's what you need. And then, as you mentioned, I mean, AJ Brown, how good is AJ Brown? I mean, when I look out at the Cleveland Browns right now, 
the one person that, you know, that you can say, you know, surefire hands, dynamic, amazing, off the charts, great playmaker that you can count on every single down, every single time out right now uh, to be at that elite, elite level is Amari Cooper, right? It's Amari Cooper. And then, you know, Donovan Peoples-Jones took a very big step up last year, and that's great. And, you know, I think David Njoku took a big step up last year. But those two guys need to keep coming up the learning curve and keep coming up the uh, talent level curve and make sure that, uh, you know, that they are super consistent with the big plays. And then you need a couple more guys after that. You can't have not dead weight, but you can't have, you know, people that aren't amazing in those rooms. You've got to be amazing. You've got to be able to go out there and be relied upon down in and down out. And when Deshaun Watson looks out there, he needs to know that if you are in a one-on-one matchup, you're going to win it and you're going to catch the ball. And if you're even if you're doubled and he puts it in the right place, you're going to come down with it. And and that has to be most of the time. So I think I still think I would be in the market for three really good pass catchers, including one that's an, like of a Pro Bowl level. And, um, you know, that that's probably, and I've been talking about it a lot, that's probably my number one, still my number one priority. But there are plenty other things that, you know, that I had watched throughout the week and that game that I said, oh, okay, the Browns are going to need to get better in that area. Okay, so let's stay on this thread. Uh, This question comes from Dave Jackson in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, Hey, Mary Kay, having watched the superb play by both teams in the Super Bowl, how far do you think the Browns are from competing with teams like this? Well, first of all, it's all going to come down to Deshaun Watson and not only how he plays, but how they call plays for him. You've got to be able to put him in Uh, situations to be super successful and you've got to surround him with the right talent. So it all begins there. If you have him playing close to uh, a Patrick Mahomes and now, I mean, look at Jalen Hurts. I think we can look at Jalen Hurts now and I think we can all agree that we all underrated and undervalued Jalen Hurts. He's a dang good quarterback. Good for him. He put, he has put himself on the, on the map this season. So it starts with Deshaun playing really, really well. If they can get that kind of play out of him, uh, then, you know, that's half the battle right there. So uh, then I think they're about three other players away. We've talked about these three other players, three key players, three key starters, and that's Pro Bowl receiver, Pro Bowl caliber defensive tackle, and Pro Bowl caliber defensive end. I think the Jalen Hurts story is so interesting. I mean, that, you know, we've talked about this with Josh Allen um, and it's different levels, but the development story of Jalen Hurts is a really great story. I mean, he he wasn't this guy a year ago. He doesn't play this game a year ago. He doesn't play this game coming out of Oklahoma, but he has become so much more accurate. He has become decisive. Like he just, he's a great development story. And I, I think this is another one of those examples, sort of like along with Josh Allen, where if you believe in a guy and you kind of build your offense around that guy, you can you can develop him into a really good quarterback as long as the talent is there and the work ethic mm-hmm. is there. And, and Jalen has both of those things. Yes, absolutely. Now, after the game, I think it was after the game or maybe during the game, uh, when they had done a pregame interview with with Patrick Mahomes, he was talking about how he was so fortunate to land with Andy Reid and that he doesn't know if he would be the quarterback that he is without Andy Reid. So I do think that your landing spot and the people that you work with and the people that are calling plays for you and surrounding you with the talent are vitally important. You can take a Jalen Hurts and put him in a less favorable environment and maybe you don't see a performance or a game like you saw last night. That was a phenomenal game. I mean, had they turned around and won that game, he's obviously the MVP of that game. Right. I mean, he was so, so good in that game. He was throwing dimes. He was on the money. He was unflappable. I was very surprised uh, at how incredibly poised he was. And like you said, decisive, 
poised and gutsy as heck. I mean, gutsy taking those shots downfield. Now we know Deshaun's not going to be afraid to do that either. Deshaun will take those shots downfield. Deshaun will take off running. I I think when you look at those two quarterbacks last night, I think Browns fans can kind of get excited about the fact that, Hey, Cleveland, you've got a quarterback that can do some of those same things. And chances are very good. You're going to see a lot of those things next season. And, um, So, you know, I think that's key. But yes, quarterback development is so vitally important. And that's what this whole offseason has got to be about, is making sure that Deshaun Watson feels great about everything he's doing. Okay, so this leads us to this question from Mike in Maryland. Hey, Mary Kay, do you think Coach Stefanski will utilize Deshaun Watson's talents in the same manner as the Eagles do with Jalen Hurts? Yes, I do. I absolutely do, especially when you know that a team just got to the Super Bowl and almost won it with a quarterback who has a skill set like your quarterback. It's a copycat league. Yes, they're going to look at things that Patrick did. They're going to look at things, the successful things that Jalen Hurts did. Uh, I mean, you know, there is crossover and you can see that there are some apples to apples comparisons there. And I think that, you know, if I'm Kevin Stefanski today, you know, he's probably up on that whiteboard just having a field day, right? I mean, they need to be like getting excited about the possibilities and what they can do. I mean, hopefully Deshaun did the same. Hopefully Deshaun, I'm sure he did. I'm sure Deshaun watched that game and thought, I've got that. I've got this. I can do this. We are going to do this. Uh, the other thing that needs to happen is, like like I mentioned before, a guy like David Njoku, he's got to step it up. I mean, okay, you've got the money, you've got the talent, you've got everything that you need now, and you have to be there. you got to take your game up one notch, and you have to be, all right, we don't necessarily expect you to be a first ballot Hall of Famer on every down like Travis Kelsey is, but now it's time for David. There's There should be nothing standing in his way. He needs to pick up his game a little bit more and live up to his first round status and live up to his yearly nice salary. So, you know, if you want to have an offense like that, you need to have a a tight end that is just dynamite. And I think he can be that. I've been saying that for a long time. I think he can be that. Now it's time for him to just go out and, and dominate. He needs to go out and dominate. I mean, he's physically got it. The one thing that I think that I see in like a, Travis Kelsey. And a lot of this is scheming him open like that. Uh, But he he gets open, like freakishly open, right? I mean, you look out there and it's like, how the heck did that happen? Part of it is his own talent and ability for doing that. And part of it is the brilliant offensive schematics, right? Like you've got to be able to try to somehow scheme him open where it looks, you know, it looks like he's running one route and then all of a sudden he's doing something completely different or whatever the case may be, get the mismatches, however you can get them. Um, But that's got to be something that happens next year. David Njoku needs to be Deshaun Watson's Travis Kelsey to the extent that he can be. Yeah, I, I mean that Kelsey, Cooper Cup, all these guys, and and this is you know this is one of the things I've I've said about you know a, a guy like Njoku, and and why I don't like comparing him to those guys. Like there are just guys who they're just open constantly, and it doesn't matter. Like if you think the Eagles didn't spend the last two weeks and even longer just trying to figure out how do we make sure Travis Kelsey isn't open. They were doing it, and it doesn't matter. The guy just gets open and he catches the football. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. Cooper Cup has, was the same way last year, and, and there's just certain guys like that who it's like, it doesn't matter how many sleepless nights and how many hours you spend. The guy's just gonna he's gonna get open. And you meant it's not just Kelsey; it's the scheme; it's it's everything. Going back to the Hertz Watson um, comparison, I, I really do think there is more there in the quarterback run game for the Browns, and it, it's not going to look you know, like quite the same necessarily because Hertz is going to run the ball more. He had, I'm, I'm looking it up here, 165 rushing attempts this season. Deshaun Watson has never had over 100 rushing attempts. And I don't think the Browns want him to rush the ball a hundred times or 150 times, but there's still 
there's something there in that quarterback run game. If it's six runs, eight runs, whatever it is, every game, if you can figure out a way to kind of utilize that and, and maximize that, it can be really dangerous. And I'm not I'm talking about scrambles, just I'm talking, you know, let's say there's seven yeah. designed runs a game. Yeah. Like, there, there's something interesting there to unlock. Yes, I, I think so. And I think they will. I think that now that they have time to dig in and, um, you know, and, and sort of like unpack this all and put it back together in a way that will best showcase Deshaun Watson's talents. I think you will see more of those designed runs. And I think they will look at more of Jalen Hurts's film. I think it was such an amazing year for him uh, that, I, that I think they will uh, look to the kinds of things that he did, the amount of times that he ran, the RPOs that he ran. I, I, I think they will use him as uh, you know, a little bit of a, a comparison, a little bit of a blueprint for how they want to do things with Deshaun Watson. And that that's fine. They'll, they should take from a few different places. You can take some things from Josh Allen, of course. You can take some things from Patrick Mahomes. I mean, Deshaun Watson talks about the the no look passes and the things that he can do. He can do that stuff. That's, you know, those things are not easy to do. Um, but Deshaun has the skill set to do it. And I think it's going to be really exciting when he is able to just kind of open it up. But then you've got to be ready for the no look pass. You've got to be able uh, to make sure that, that you can handle that kind of a, you know, improvisational type of quarterback and, and offense. You've got to be on high alert at all times. You've got to make sure that you stay in your quarterback's line of sight so that he can always see you when, when he gets start scrambling around, you've got to make sure that not only are you, you know, staying focused in on the ball might come to you. You've got to be somewhere where your quarterback can see you so that he can get the ball to you and that he does know that you're there. But then once all of that stuff happens, think about the incredible receiving talent of, of, of a guy like a Travis Kelsey. I mean, there, there was that one pass and, and he, the beauty of Travis and Patrick is that they know each other so well. And Deshaun Watson doesn't have that kind of chemistry with any of his players yet. They're all new to him, but the beauty of a Patrick and a Travis is that when Patrick's in trouble and, and throws the ball at Travis's shoe tops, he's going to go get it. He, he's going to reach down and he's going to catch it because he knows that it's not always going to be perfect, that Pat's going to be in trouble, that somebody's going to be about to drill him. And wherever he is on the field, you're going to figure it out. And wherever he puts the ball, you're going to catch it. And that's going to be a key for these guys. They've got to stay alive. They have to be ready for the ball to come low, to come high to come on their back hip, to come behind them. And they have to make incredible acrobatic catches if this whole thing is going to go. And I think that's one of the common denominators that we've seen in some of these amazing offenses. All right, let's take a break. Uh, we're going to turn our focus a little more uh, inside the Browns here uh, on the other side as we continue the Orange and Brown Talk podcast, a Hey Mary Kay edition on a Monday. And welcome back to the Orange and Brown Talk podcast. Dan Lobby, Mary Kay Cabot, a Hey Mary Kay edition of the podcast on a Monday, the day after the Super Bowl. So, uh, Mary Kay, there was some assistant coaching news here over, you know, over the last day or two. Um, you reported about Drew Petzing uh, potentially leaving if Jonathan Gannon gets the Cardinals job. Uh, so a question here from Robert from Ponte Vedra, Florida. Hey, Mary Kay. With announced and speculated departures of defensive coaches, who do you think Jim Schwartz intends to bring on board? But let's just start with the, before we get to the defensive side of the ball, let's just start with the offensive side of the ball. If Petzing does in fact leave, what do you think the next step is at quarterbacks coach? And um, could there be more offensive staff changes coming outside of like the domino effect of maybe replacing Petzing? You know, there there could be, uh, there possibly could be, because if you decide that, um, you know, that T.C. McCartney, 
who was an offensive assistant working primarily with quarterbacks in his first two years here before he took over tight ends last year. Um, if you decide to promote him to quarterbacks coach, uh, then of course that leaves open the tight end job, right? So, um, you know, so that's how, you know, these things can, can get shifted around a little bit. Um, but in, in doing my, I started to, you know, like kind of read the tea leaves a little bit and put two and two together. And, you know, by the time I got to, um, I think it was just, you know, probably just yesterday, by the time I got to yesterday, I was like, it's, it's Drew Petzing. It's going to be Drew, he's going to hire Drew Petzing as his offensive coordinator. So I had to do some, uh, you know, trying to get some confirmation on that. But after all of my reporting throughout the week, I was like, that's where he's going with this. Right. And um, I think he's going to be his first choice. And I think that um, with Jonathan Gannon, I asked him point blank uh, if he feels ready for a head coaching job. He said yes. So if he's offered that job, you know, I mean, there's probably a pretty good chance he's going to take it. Um, there are only 32 of these jobs. And if he does take it, then I think he's bringing Drew Petzing with him. And I think Drew Petzing will willingly go with him. They worked together for four years in Minnesota. And when you have a chance for that kind of a promotion and you are going to call the plays, you take it, right? So I don't know. I think there's a pretty darn good chance that this is going to happen. Of course, you never know. You can never, you know, you never say nothing is written in stone until it actually happens. But I think that this is there's a good chance this is going to happen. Now, there's also that possibility then that Kevin Stefanski will hire a quarterback's coach from outside. Now, maybe there's somebody that um, that Deshaun has worked with. I mean, what about? Quincy Avery, right? I mean, like you just never, you just never know. Um, so I would say that, um, you know, anything can happen at this point and, and there, there could possibly be some, um, you know, some other changes depending on, on what happens, but that's, what's going on on the offensive side of the ball. I haven't heard anything about you know, movement on the part of Alex Van Pelt. He's not calling plays, not slated to call plays next year. I mean, you would kind of think that if you were Alex Van Pelt, you would want to go somewhere and call plays so that you can kind of move up the the ranks and see if you can't get yourself in line for a head coaching job. So, you know, I don't know. I think we should hear some things probably towards the end of the week once we know if Drew Petzing is gone. I was curious who some of his quarterbacks coaches were in Houston uh, while you were talking. I, I looked it up. Um, one of his quarterback coaches for two years in Houston in 2019 and 2020 was a name Browns fans might remember, Carl Smith. Mm-hmm. Yes. Who, uh, who was he? Was he a quarterbacks coach here? I actually didn't let's see here. Yes, he, he uh, was yeah, a he quarterbacks coached. coach. Yeah, he coached quarterbacks here in 2009, 2010, did it in 2001 till 2003. So uh, uh, he is in his 70s, so probably not the guy that they would bring on. But I was just just a little bit of trivia there uh, as, we, as we look at potential quarterback coaches if Petzing actually leaves. And, you know, I think the key there, like you said, is, is the play calling. It, you know, he interviewed in Oakland, or I guess it was Las Vegas by then. He interviewed in Las Vegas under Josh McDaniel um, last year. And then he ended up being the quarterbacks coach. There's not really another promotion there for Drew if if Kevin if Kevin wants to keep him in Cleveland, especially if play calling is on the table in Arizona. Absolutely, and I think it it would be because well it will be because um, because Jonathan Gannon is the defensive head coach, so his offensive coordinator is going to call the plays. So it's a tremendous opportunity for Drew Petzing, and philosophically. Jonathan Gannon and I, when I did the feature story on him, because of course he's from St. Ignatius High School in Cleveland, he's got a really cool story, uh, was just trying to make the golf team and uh, and ended up getting cut from the golf team. That led him into playing football at St. Ignatius. And then he's got a, you know, a, a cool story that goes on from there, includes an injury, a career ending injury in college and, and whatnot. Um, but we got talking about a little bit of philosophy and his philosophy 
in in building a coaching staff is that you don't necessarily have to have called plays for him to promote you into that role. That's not what he's all about. He will go by, you know, your football acumen, your, you know, the way that you deal with players, you know, how you might coach a position or how he has seen you coach a position before and whether or not you actually have called plays at that spot offensively or defensively is not part of his criteria. He was saying that that's how it went with, with Nick Sirianni, Nick Sirianni, when he was with the Eagles, he hired Jonathan Gannon to be his defensive coordinator and Jonathan Gannon had never called a play before. Um, He Shane Steichen now, Jonathan said Shane had only called plays for a year. So I don't know if that's exactly. Nick, Nick gave right? up the play calling at some point. I think it was last year. He gave up play calling yeah. like halfway through the year. I don't I don't know the exact timing of it, but he yeah. gave up play calling during last season. Yeah. And before that, in, um, in Indy, I think Shane – according to Jonathan had only called plays for like one full year before he started calling plays regularly for the Eagles. And, and he, then he also said that like the special teams coordinator had never been a special teams coordinator before. So his philosophy is bring in really smart football people that you like as people that you like the way they coach and teach and throw them out there and let them do their thing. So he, I think he's going to hire Drew and, you know, you know, Drew, I know Drew, he's a great guy. I mean, he's just a great guy. The players love him. Uh, he's got a really calming demean- demeanor about himself. I think he's going to do a really nice job. Uh, and then it's just a matter of figuring out who's going to be the quarterback's coach. So it's an op- it will be an opportunity for Kevin Stefanski to bring somebody in that, um, that Deshaun Watson has a, a great comfort level with somebody that he's either worked with before or somebody that Kevin Stefanski has worked with before uh, that he thinks will be amazing for Deshaun. Again, it could be TC McCartney. TC was a, um, a backup quarterback for LSU. So he knows the position he, you know, he's, he's played the position he's familiar with it and he was good at coaching it uh, as an offensive assistant in 2021. So maybe it will be him. Um, But this opens up, you know, some some possibilities for how to uh you know to get some guys in here to to get some new eyes on the situation yeah i think it would be a great nothing nothing against tc mccartney it would be great to get like a voice in the building that maybe hasn't been around the last few years just you know bring in ideas like you said just lots and lots of ideas um Let's let's talk about the defensive side of the ball, though, as well, which is uh, originally what the question was about, because in that story today about Drew Petzing, and by the way, go back and read the Jonathan Gannon story. I was reading it yesterday, and it the part that struck me is the part where uh, they're talking about the free throws, how, how mm-hmm. he was shooting the free throws at the end of the state championship game. And it just made me think of like how people used to talk about Kevin. Um, yeah. just this unflappable, like calm guy, like you, you want him in these, in these high stress situations. So go, uh, go check that out at cleveland.com slash Browns, uh, when you have some time today, but on the defensive side of the ball, you mentioned Chris Kiffin could be on the move again. And one of the mm-hmm. points you made is if that job comes open, the defensive line coach job, that's probably one, not, not probably that is one of the most important positions mm-hmm. on this staff because it's Jim Schwartz's defensive line coach. Absolutely 100%. And I I think that's going to happen. I think Chris Kiffin is going to be on the move. I don't know if he'll go back to Ole Miss and join Lane again. I don't know if he'll go somewhere else in the NFL. I'm not sure exactly what will happen there, but I expect him to be gone. And, um, and I expect Jim Schwartz to have an opportunity to bring in his guy or Kevin Stefanski to bring in his guy and pair him up with Jim Schwartz. I think that Jim Schwartz would probably have a say in who the defensive line coach is going to be, because like you just said, I think it's the most important position on the defensive staff under Jim Schwartz. It, it obviously is because, you know, that's his baby. Defensive line is his baby and he's going to make sure uh, that th- those guys are coached up in the way that he wants them to be. So not exactly sure. You know, it'll be interesting because 
Jonathan Gannon and Jim Schwartz having both worked for the Philadelphia Eagles. I mean, Jim Schwartz worked there for five years before he left and kind of went into semi-retirement and worked for, uh, went back to the Titans for a couple of years, but he's got a lot of connections with the Eagles. And then of course, Jonathan Gannon has a lot of connections with the Eagles. So, you know, they might be vying for some of the same people for some of these spots. We'll have to see how that works out. But, um, but yes, it'll be very, um, very key. Whoever comes in as Jim Schwartz's defensive line coach. And I, like I said, I think the dominoes dominoes will start to fall now uh, as this week unfolds. Okay. So we have, uh, there's a lot of questions left over that we will get to on Tuesday, but I'm going to ask um, some, I don't know if this is a non-football question or not. I guess it could be. What is, what was the most memorable part of the Super Bowl yesterday? It could be in the game. It could be uh, a commercial. It could be, Rihanna, I don't know. What was your most memorable, like, what was your most memorable takeaway watching that game yesterday? Uh, You know what? It's not hard for me to answer. And that is to see Patrick Mahomes get injured the way that he did and to see the amount of pain that he was in hopping off that field, right? And then to see him over on, on the bench and at one point, he put his head down. Did you see that? He put his head down on the shoulder of, I don't know if it was the quarterback's coach. I'm not sure who, who, was, who it was. But he put his head down on, on the guy's shoulder. And <laughs> it, was, it was a poignant moment. I mean, it was, it was sad because it was like, oh, my God, what do I do now? He was in so much pain. And for him to come out and do what he did, including a 20-some plus yard scramble that was one of the key plays of the game, and to play with the moxie and the poise that he did, and to absolutely pull out that game, knowing that he was in that much pain, that to me was was everything. I've always been a Patrick fan ever since I've told you that story where I, where I got to interview him uh, during the 2017 Super Bowl on Radio Row, did my little one-on-one interview with him. Uh, I produced a little video, licious video from my phone all by myself. I'm very proud of myself for that. Um, <laughs> and uh, and and so I've always been a Patrick fan. It's hard not to be a Patrick fan, right? I mean, just the way that he plays. I love the basketball-y, you know, no-look passes. I love the... I love the other sports that he brings to the game, the baseball side of him. And um, I just think he's phenomenal. And to see him go out and do what he did, knowing full well that he just wanted to go lay down somewhere and put his foot up and put a big bag of ice on it. uh, I just thought that was everything to me. I felt like this year more than other years. um, And I actually wrote this in one of maybe it was like a newsletter or something where I, where I said why I was picking the chiefs. I, I felt like this year, Patrick Mahomes was just really aware of his legacy and like mm-hmm. really aware of where he is and kind of like where things could go because he's only, he's 27, right? So he's still young. Mm-hmm. Um, but had he lost this, he would have been one and two in super bowls and he, I'm sure he would have heard about it. And also like, you know, you hear the Chiefs, and all of this is so manufactured. This is what football players do. But you hear the Chiefs after the game saying everybody was counting them out and, like, nobody thought, well, okay, no, you're the Kansas City Chiefs. Nobody was counting you out. But right, I think there's something to this idea that Mahomes spent the last year hearing about Joe Burrow and Josh Allen and all these other guys who aren't him. And I don't – I just – there was something just watching from afar that was different about him. And I – I'd have to go back and look, but I think after one of the touchdowns they scored, it might have been the one to go ahead eight points. He kind of ushered everybody off the field, like really quickly. Like they were starting to celebrate, and he kind of ushered everybody off the field after the touchdown, and, and they didn't really celebrate it a ton. I just, I, I feel like there's something there with him and that legacy, and he's kind of starting to, I think he sees what's possible and what's in front of him. And I think it's, I don't know, I just, I sense that there's something there now that he's really kind of thinking about that. Yeah, I think so too. And I think uh, part of the reason for that is he didn't go to the Super Bowl last year. And that is 
a reminder that you can't take it for granted and that there's always somebody really good coming up behind you that is going to have a chance to knock you out of this thing. And I really think that um, not getting there last year was was very, very difficult on him, uh, especially for somebody that wants to be thought of as, as the best. And I actually got the chance. I might have been the first one to ask him at this Super Bowl, hey, are you trying to, you know, do you think you can catch Tom Brady now that he retired? So I, it was on opening night, and I actually tweeted it out. Uh, you can see that it's like he's looking right at my little camera phone right there. Um, so I got to ask him that, and I, I might have been the first one that asked him that question. I'm, I'm not sure, but because um, I wasn't standing there the whole entire time, but he he sort of answered it like it was the first time. And I've seen other people use the quotes and stuff like that from then. Um, but, you know, I mean, I, I think there is a chance. I mean, he, like he's only 27. If, if he has the longevity um, and not many people are going to have that kind of longevity, for goodness sakes, that Tom Brady did. But I, I think that uh, Patrick is talented enough to catch Tom Brady. And if he can make sure uh, that he keeps Andy Reid you know, healthy and going strong for the next 10 years, 10, 12 years, then, then they can do it. Yeah. And, and I think to seeing him kind of fight through that ankle and, you know, you have to learn what it takes sometimes. And I, I feel like this was one of those years, you know, they, they went to Tampa, they went to Tampa a couple of years ago and he just got beat up and that line was a mess and they, they just couldn't figure it out. And I, th- I think that combined with, like you said, not going to the Super Bowl last year, um, and and then just seeing him fight through that ankle injury, like it just there there was just something different about Patrick this year. I thought, and I think I, that's really scary uh, for the rest of the AFC and probably the rest of the NFL too, uh, including including the Browns. Um, okay, yes, we like I said, we have more questions left. So as we've been kind of doing here throughout this off season, we're going to do another Hey Mary Kay uh, tomorrow. So just make sure you're subscribed to this podcast on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Uh, and also become a football insider subscriber, cleveland.com slash Browns, the blue banner at the top of the page to become one of our tech subscribers, which is where we get these questions from uh, twice a week. And uh, you also get a newsletter, you get access to stories on cleveland.com slash Browns that are for subscribers only. Uh, so make sure you check that out and also check out Mary Kay's story while you're there. It's cleveland.com slash Browns and click on that blue banner at the top of the page. Uh, Mary Kay, I'll talk to you later. Sounds great. Sounds great.